Uh, okay, well, thank you for coming. Um, and I am Louise Sittens, and I'm an associate professor of art history in uh, the Department of Art, Graphic Design, and Art History at Oklahoma State, and the curator, of course, of Centering Modernism. So uh, today, um, for the Lunch and Learn, I wanted to do something a little different than what I've talked about before in this show, and I thought um, I might as well go back to maybe how I connected with McVicker um, on a more kind of individual level um, from the get-go. Um, and, uh, and for me, uh, it has always been important to identify Jay as a printmaker. Um, I don't think, and I say in the book, I don't think he would have identified himself uh, in relationship to a particular medium, he thought of himself as an artist, and he worked obviously in painting and printmaking and drawing and sculpture, um, all kinds of different media. But uh, my own background is in printmaking, a variety of kinds of printmaking, um, including letterpress uh, and uh, other things, but mostly intaglio printmaking, which is the broad umbrella term for etching, engraving, dry point, mezzo tint, anything where you're uh, cutting into a piece of metal in order to make your image. And so uh, I thought um, two things. First of all, one of the most frustrating things about museums is you're not allowed to touch anything. Um, so I thought I would bring in a bunch of stuff that we could touch. And second of all, one of the most uh, challenging things about printmaking for audiences who are not uh, studio artists themselves is that there are all these different techniques and no one knows what they are and what they mean. And you see these words on museum labels and it's like, well, that's not helpful at all. So I brought in um, three examples of my work. I am not a professional artist, and so this is work that I've done for fun in various situations. Um, I'm not presenting these as museum quality objects. I'm presenting them as evidence of a process, um, which I say uh, in part to excuse my um, graduate school goof off work, and in part, um, because actually I think it's sometimes easier to see how the processes work when you look at something done badly than, than when you see something done really well. So we're gonna start with these examples because we can get up close and really talk about what they look like. And I'm gonna encourage you all, I'm gonna pass the plates around, but I think the um, prints themselves, maybe if we come up and look at them, it's a bit easier because the paper's kind of large. Um, and even though I just devalued my own work, I actually value it quite highly. <laughs> and I don't want it to get dinged up. Um, and then I thought we could go into the gallery and look at Rick Vicker, who combines um, all these different processes uh, in individual prints um, and start to parse, like really learn how to look at them differently and how to see printmaking processes. Um, occasionally I get to teach the history of printmaking and really getting people to understand what they're looking at is a huge part of the rewarding aspect of teaching printmaking history. Uh, so that was also one of my goals here. Um, so, like I said, intaglio printmaking is basically cutting into a piece of metal, and traditionally um, that metal has been copper, so this is a little sheet of copper, as you can see. Um, etching uh, specifically uses acid to do that, so you cover the copper with wax, essentially, and you scrape into it. It's okay, I left my etching beetle behind the counter over there. Um, you want to just bring my whole bag up here? Sorry. <laughs> Um, it's not really that important because it's literally just a needle. Um, so etching uh, was invented basically at the end of the 16th century. Uh, Albrecht Durer did some etchings, but like four-ish. Uh, don't quote me on that exact number. But when Durer was making etchings, he was using iron and it didn't work very well. It rusted and it was not um, particularly successful. So uh, he did not pursue it. And then the 17th century etching um, they figure out they could do it on copper, and then it has a lot fewer issues um, than using iron, and so it becomes incredibly popular. Uh, Rembrandt van Rijn is one of the most famous etchers of the 17th century, and he did all of his work on copper, and he used the same process, essentially, that people use today. He took that copper plate, he covered it in this waxy ground. Thank you. He took his etching meal, which I will show you. Um, is literally just a stick with a little pointy wheel at the top of it, and he drew into it. So the advantage of this compared 
to engraving is that drawing in wax, so you can imagine, is much easier and much more like drawing. I can hold this like a pencil, I can draw with it like a pencil. Um, whereas if you're engraving into a piece of metal before that uh, wax innovation, you had to cut your lines directly in and you were literally slicing through metal. It was hard, uh, it took a lot of physical strength, it took a lot of discipline and skill, and it felt nothing like drawing. So uh, one of the reasons that Rembrandt embraces etching is because it allows him to be very experimental, to be very fluid, to uh, create a print as fast as he would create a drawing. Um, and uh, I will pass that around. I'm just going to pass around as well. This, this, is, this involved in the acids being applied? Oh, yeah, I left a whole part of the process out. No, I, I didn't point that. <laughs> so, so you put the wax down, you scratch the drawing in, and then you put it in acid. The acid eats away the lines that you scratched through the wax. Um, and so what you'll see as I pass this around is if you run your finger down over it, you can feel um, that there is actually the lines are cut into the metal plate. Then you cover it with ink, you wipe away the ink, um, but it stays in the lines because they're indented. So you have a clean surface with lines carved into it that are filled now with ink. Then you run it through a press, super high pressure, um, the paper gets pushed into the lines, which then it picks up the ink from those lines and you have the image. So that's this, is the print from this. You'll notice a couple of things. The image is reversed because the paper was on the plate like that and it comes off and so you have the mirror image. Um, and the lines are uh, pretty pretty detailed. You can get quite a lot of, and remember, this is like me doing this on the fly, not trying very hard. I was in a workshop um, doodling after I gave a talk. Uh, and so this was done in about 10 minutes. Um, and uh, But you can still see that you can get really fine detail even when you're just kind of uh, not thinking very hard about your line work. Um, so, the reason that I speak at length about Rembrandt is not just because he was the first really, really important uh, etcher, but also because his attitude about experimentalism was really key to the whole history of printmaking and intaglio printmaking um, and etching specifically as a medium. Um, because that ability to be experimental, to work really rapidly, to have lots of different um, effects from the same uh, basic plate and image that you've drawn um, was something that fascinated Rembrandt. He printed his plates as though they were monoprints. He would put a lot of ink on one time, and the next time he would put hardly any ink in there um, and create different kind of uh, visual, emotional effects based on how he manipulated that basic object. Um, and uh, people call that monoprinting. And monoprint is something um, that uh, has perhaps a shared matrix, but every impression is different. And so um, McVicker is someone who loved this. As we go through the show, we'll see in some cases, early on in his printmaking, um, he was making prints where he wanted every impression to look exactly the same. But as he moved on through his career, he started to think about printmaking as something that you could experiment with, that every impression could actually be completely different from the one before it. Um, and so that was pretty important. For McVicker, uh, another thing that was important for him was moving beyond line etching. So that's a line etching, it's just been scratched through, to something called uh, aquatint. And so in a lot of those labels, you'll see etching in aquatint or aquatint. Um, and this is a medium, of course, that Dole Reed was also famous for using and that McVicker learned from uh, Reed. But um, here I have my aquatinted plate. And as you'll see when I pass it around, this one happens to be on zinc. I took printmaking as a grad student at Stanford, and they have pioneered um, non-toxic etching processes. So they don't use acid anymore. They use an electrolytic uh, process uh, on zinc, so you have to plug it in. Um, but apart from that, it's the same. Um, and so uh, what we have here is you'll see lines that I did as straight line etching. And then I recovered the plate uh, with a ground, but instead of covering it with a solid sheet of that waxy ground, um, we, uh, in fact, used spray paint. Um, and we took a spray can and we sprayed uh, a light layer of spray paint over it so uh, that it was just little dots. You can imagine kind of like an airbrush. You get little dots instead of a solid layer. 
And so if you look at any bit of this plate as I pass it around that looks gray, you'll see that it's actually not a solid gray, it's a bunch of little speckles. And that's because when you spray that spray paint on and then put it in acid, the acid eats around all of the dots of spray paint and makes basically a half tone pattern, a, a grayscale dot pattern. Um, that is uneven, you'll see again as you pass it around, it's kind of uneven. Um, and then you put it in the acid and you take it out at various moments and cover bits of it in solid ground. So in this case, uh, you'll see from the print, which is not very clean, um, the clouds I uh, covered immediately. They didn't get any acid biting. Um, but the other grayscale parts I put in for maybe five minutes and then 10 minutes and then 15 and then 20. I'm making up those numbers. I can't remember what I did. Um, but the longer you leave it in, the deeper the acid bites in and the more ink it can hold, so the darker the print is. Um, so again, I'll pass those around. Did you apply the ground with a brush? So traditionally, the way you do it is you, um, because when you went in and picked out certain areas. Yeah, so, uh, so traditionally you put your plate in this box and you make a cloud of uh, resin dust and that settles on it and makes the dot pattern. And then you go in and yeah, you have uh, basically the ground that you would usually use and a paintbrush and you just paint out, um, they call it stopping out the bits that you don't want to uh, etch anymore. So, yeah. Um, so Aquas Hint is great because it gives you grayscale. Um, so instead of just the black and white line, you suddenly have the whole range of colors. Um, and then, uh, what happens uh, pretty much with the advent of aqua tint is you start getting color in printmaking. There was a stigma against color in printmaking for a long time. People thought that color was uh, gaudy and kind of commercial looking and not attractive. Um, but by the 19th century, people were really interested in experimenting with color. Um, and probably the most famous color printmaker uh, certainly in American art history, but possibly worldwide from a European or American tradition, uh, is Mary Cassatt, who saw an exhibition of Japanese woodblock prints in Paris um, around the turn of the century, and she decided that she wanted to create color prints herself. But she said, you know, woodblock is an Asian tradition. I'm a, a, an American, um, Euro-American artist. I want to work in a printmaking tradition that's part of my art history. And so she decided to work in aqua tint. Um, and she added the color, um, not by uh, making a, a color separation, um, which Mac Vicker did, and we'll talk about when we go into the gallery, but actually by doing something called inking a la pupe. So I bring in an example of that. For this last print, uh, which I will show you upright. This is the one I'm not going to pass around. I think it's a little too fragile. Um, here I have obviously uh, four colors. I have the black outline and then I have red, yellow, and blue. Um, and the plates, uh, I have two of them. I have one that's the black outline, so that's just a line etching um, like the others. Uh, and uh, then I have the color plate, which is all aqua tint. Um, and uh, to get three colors on one plate, what I had to do then was go in and ink just the sections that I wanted that color in. Um, and I'm gonna encourage you guys to come up and look. What I did was I used a Q-tip to apply the ink. It was painful. This is my only impression <laughs> of this print. Um, and uh, I was doing this at a workshop in San Francisco and the printmakers there were like, you are never gonna color you're, that's not going to work. Your, your areas are too small. You can't do it. And I was like, don't tell me I can't do something. Um, and it did work, but like I said, I did it once. Um, so uh, you have the aqua tints, and then you take your Q-tip or whatever you're using to ink it, and you carefully just put the ink on the parts you want. So this now has become not printmaking as we think of it as kind of a me mechanical, uh, instantaneous kind of process. This is not quick. Um, and it's not intended to make a huge number of multiples, right? People often talk about printmaking, like, oh, the value of printmaking is that you can make hundreds of something with uh, almost no more effort than making just one. And that is really not true. As we look at McVicker's prints in the show, we have to look at those and be like, each one of those to print 
was hours of work. This was not like, oh, I'm gonna crank out 30 prints this afternoon. It was like, I was probably doing one a day or something like this. Um, and so uh, printing them together, we get the black from the lion print and then we get the color from the aqua tint plate. Um, when McVicker does a color separation, he is trying to speed that process up. So instead of having just the two plates, um, which I did partly because I wanted to experiment with that inking a la coupe, that combined color on one plate process, um, but also partly because copper is really expensive and I had been at this workshop and spent quite a lot of money, frankly, to be at the workshop in the first place and then on materials. And so I was like, well, I'm not gonna buy a yard square of copper because that's um, an investment uh, that maybe I don't wanna make. Um, so uh, McVicker happily was not in that situation. He clearly could afford as much copper as he wanted because he made a bajillion prints. Um, but so he would make a different plate for each color and that way he could just ink it with a roller and wipe it off and um, a roller is sort of a not accurate representation, but he could just whack the ink on the plate, wipe it as usual, it was much faster. He would have four plates, one for each color and call it a day. So as we go through the show, we'll look at circumvention, which has um, just one of the plates there, but we're gonna see if we can figure out which color it is uh, in the final print. So I will pass those around so you can see that difference. Um, and then I encourage you to come up and look at the print itself. Um, so I was talking about sort of intaglio printmaking as uh, appealing to people because of the possibilities of experimentation, but I also uh, really wanted to underscore the tactility of it. One of the things that McVicker really likes doing um, was embossing. And so if you, when I was passing around that aqua tint plate and I said, the longer you put it in, the deeper the holes get, the more ink it holds, at some point that process uh, stops working. If you etch too deeply, then when you wipe the plate, you wipe the ink right back out of the holes because it's too um, open, it's too available to the cleaning process. Um, and he did that on purpose because he wanted um, to create embossment rather than lines, he wanted, or rather than inked lines, he wanted blank lines. Um, and so dimensionality is something that I think people don't think about in terms of printmaking. Um, but in all of the prints that I passed around in the plates, you can see that there is a three-dimensionality and he was really interested in highlighting the three-dimensionality of those images. Um, so also, I don't know where the prints ended up that I was passing around, but um, I store these stacked on each other, so I'm not sure if you can feel it, but um, you can feel a little bit of texture if you rub your fingers over them, and I encourage you to do that because these are not valuable. Um, but also you can see the plate mark, and so there's a big indentation um, where those are. <laughs> so, um, yeah. Uh, He's interested in dimensionality. He's interested in the materiality of the process. And I think for me, that's where I really connected with him. I have done a lot of different kinds of printmaking um, and etching is my favorite because of uh, just the way the process feels to do. It's sort of a not quantifiable um, relationship, but my connection to McVicker really solidified when I realized how much he was enjoying the process of etching. And um, some of the archives that I got to go through had sort of two dozen proofs of a print where he was trying different colors and different inkings and techniques, um, layering things, uh, really fascinating kind of experimental mind at work, and um, really playful. And I think people also tend to think of printmaking as something that's kind of uh, process driven and a little bit uptight compared to other media. Um, but he really had an energy in his printmaking that was very, very playful um, and uh, thoughtful, but also sometimes a little silly, which is uh, exciting for me to see in his work. Um, so at this point, I think, why don't uh, people come up if they want to, and then we'll go into the gallery and actually look at some of his work um, and see what we think about it. So why could you talk a little bit about the registration process? Yeah. Um, um, you don't have to go away. <laughs> just to give them an idea for anybody. Yeah, so one of the um, 
one of the challenges when you have more than one plate, right, is that you have to line them up. So you have, uh, in this case, I don't actually remember which one I printed first, um, but you have to run it through the press twice, right? So you have to make sure that your paper is in the same place in relation to the plate both times. Otherwise, this one could be printed here and that one could be printed there, and that doesn't work at all. Um, and in this one, actually, I also I should have said uh, it's on chine collé, which is basically French for pasted uh, paper, um, pasted tissue paper. And uh, so there's a layer of paper underneath this that then the ink is on top of. And that all happens in the press. So um, basically you have your press bed, it's a table and rollers and it goes through um, the rollers along the tabletop. And you just have to, like you have something there, mylar or whatever. I know that you know this already. Um, and you make little corner marks for your paper and you make corner marks for the plate and then you have to hope they line up. Um, and you have to hope that when you run through the press, the press doesn't shift things around. Um, it gets especially tricky the more plates you do because every time you run it through the press, the paper stretches a little bit and so it's actually a different shape. Um, and your image is changing shape along with the paper, obviously. Uh, so suddenly your image is this wide and your plates are only this wide and they don't line up anymore no matter what you do. Um, so there's all kinds of fun challenges. How do you register one plate to the other when you are creating the plates? Uh, in this case, I actually um, printed this onto a sheet of paper and then before it was dry, I ran the blank copper underneath it through the press so that I printed onto the paper and then I drew um, over that. <laughs> Yeah, so you have to think about all kinds of, uh, you really have to think ahead in printmaking and there's a lot of planning um, and uh, a lot of screwing up, which is also kind of fun to see and fun to fix. So, um, yeah, should we go look at actual print makers? So my first time, so I was a student at Joel Reed uh, as a printmaking student and Reed is famous for his awkward technique. techniques. Uh, but Vicker, I think, easily surpassed him. He, even Reed would have acknowledged that McVicker's prints were superlative. Um, and so in these two early aqua tints, I think this one especially, like think about the aqua tint I showed you of mine, that was like, sketchy. Uh, if you look at this and you think, he's, he's making this image the same way that I made that one. He's just thinking about how many times am I going to put it in the acid and take it out to create those different grayscale tones? Um, in mine, it was very obvious where I stopped out things. Like you could see that was stage one, that was stage two, that was stage three. I defy you to look at this and tell me how many times he took it in and out of the acid. It is like he gets um, this incredible shading uh, that he uh, has almost a continuous tone from white. Uh, to gray. He has all kinds of stuff happening in this print um, that are just incredible, uh, technically speaking. Um, and uh, this uh, is labeled trial proof, like this was just him kind of testing out the inking before he did the addition that he was happy with. So he's uh, inking it again and again, trying to figure out like, how do I have to do this to make it look the way I want it to look? Um, and this one is much more stylized, and so it looks like maybe it was simpler, but again, like if you look at it, he has uh, this level of detail and texture that's really amazing. Um, just the subtleties of the tone that he manages to produce from his technique uh, is pretty cool. But these are completely sort of traditional etching and aqua tint. They're very straightforward. They're what you would learn if you took an etching class uh, today um, at OSU or anywhere. Um, and he continues to work in that style. All of these are the same thing. The style of the imagery changes, but the technique stays the same. Um, and it's not until we get uh, to a print like this one where he starts to think a little bit differently about how he um, So dark structure, um, I just called it a color aqua tint on paper. That's what it is. Um, but he's using multiple plates here. So he has a... Uh, probably a plate for each color. Um, his plates don't all survive, so I don't know that for sure. 
Um, it could be like that Peking a la Poupe that I was talking about. Because these color areas are very separate, he may in fact have just had a plate that had all the color blocks and done them separately because it's quite easy to ink them separately when they're not um, contiguous with one another. Um, but we do have a set of proofs that are just the black plate that he printed in a bunch of different shades of blue that are super gorgeous. Um, I could have done a completely sort of useless but beautiful version of this show where it was just like, look at this random thing he did once. Um, and so we do have a certain amount of information in the archive about uh, the number of plates and how they worked. But here he's actually taking that awkward hint and instead of trying to create a naturalistic kind of descriptive realistic image, he's exploiting the natural kind of mathematical geometry of the awkward hint process uh, to create this visual image that is also geometric. So what I mean by that is um, because the way that awkward tint works, you put it into the eyes and you take it out, there's this kind of binary quality to it, right? A mathematical quality of it's in and then it's out. Um, there uh, is a playfulness about this one for me, where he is saying um, the geometric logic of the image itself is made possible in part by the fact that he has this very kind of like, it's light gray and then it's a darker gray and then it's a darker gray and then it's black. Um, that he's layering all those things together. Um, but I said that he has this playful engagement with print making, and I think the color is where that comes back, right? He's like, this would be a very serious kind of, um, almost intellectual piece, and then he adds the color in, so now it looks a little bit more like uh, building blocks or a child's game, or it looks like um, something a little different because of those primary colors. And so he's thinking very seriously about structure, not just as a visual thing, but also as a material thing, as part of his process, um, which uh, I think is really interesting. Um, and he continues to use uh, aqua tint um, for the rest of his career. He uh, is committed to it even as he explores other printmaking media. So as we go around, um, we can see screen printing. Um, another thing is that's interesting. So, um, we included the, or I included the plate for small town elements, um, which is the print on the other side, so you can kind of see. I think this also really lays out that geometry, and you can see uh, in the plate the same kind of logic of the process that I was talking about with um, the print over there. That idea that the squares really have their own weight, and you see the pacing and the time. Um, small town elements is a cubist print, and when people talk about cubism, they often talk about it as a way to explore the fourth dimension of time in visual art. Uh, and I think printmaking also for McVicker, it's about time, it's about the time of the process, and the aqua tint really underscores that, that each uh, shade of gray is actually uh, also an increment of time. Um, so this is circumvention. I mentioned that it's a multi-plate print. Um, I don't say how many plates, but I think this is one where we do know. In any case. Um, so what I said earlier is that I was going to ask you guys if you could tell which color in the final print that plate was for. So can you? Might have to get closer. <laughs> and if you know, then how do you know? You are able to make close that. You have to put those together and figure out what in the print was printed by that plate. So ordinarily you would print from light to dark. Um, yeah, it's really, 
I mean, I'd like, I, so I'm asking this question, I have not sat here and answered this, especially that orphan question, I don't know which ones came when. I don't know, I think the end maybe it's right on this, but this, in this frame, this area is less exposed. Mm -hmm. Less exposed, yeah, exactly. Yeah, which means that it would print white. Basically, if it's if it's shiny, it's essentially going to print white, right? So we need to look at what where there is a missing color. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, the white would have to be debossed first, otherwise it would be any color. Yeah, or every plate has to have the same gloss. Yeah, so suddenly it's like. You know, in order to make it a little more complicated when I was describing my basic questions, and some people look at this and it's like, oh, like when I say planning, he was doing a lot of thinking on the planning. And um, this kind of, like, for me, this is kind of visual archaeology. Like, how do we uh, extrapolate from the image the plate that's being used? When it gets this complicated, it gets really, really hard. Um, so I have thought in the past as I looked at this, that it was, I think you might have printed the purple more than once, or that might be the purple, I don't even know. Um, it makes me wonder, because like now you can set that all up on your computer screen and go back and back and forth. Yeah. Is that good or is that bad? I mean, this way you spend more time with your tests, because you don't get another test till the next day. Yeah. <laughs> Huh. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. Um, at this point, most of the I don't have a really high grade kind of digital print process. Um, because it is so much easier to figure out some of these, right? And it's like, let's not make that mistake <laughs> on these sides of the topic. Yes, I think you too, but it's reverse. Image. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Instead of even though I've done this, I'm still looking at the mic. There it is, but you have to flip it. So, yeah. Yeah. Do you know how many maximum number of The highest number that I've seen someone claim, and I've never seen the actual plates, is about 12. Um, I don't see a number on here, I think that's because I don't know for sure, but I think that uh, Lee Stone, who owns this, this print, um, I think he says this is seven or eight. And I don't think you would wonder, but I don't. No, that's just how many, yeah. So this is the other thing. So they take a long time to print, right? And prints often, especially, basically, starting around 1900, artists would addition to the print to a specific number and then destroy the plate. Um, which Mick Vicker did not destroy this plate in part because he had decided to make an edition of 20 of this print, but he only printed 10. And that's because it is really labor intensive, and so he would print them on demand, uh, essentially, into the edition by now. So even when we see a number that like says down here, um, edition 20, uh, that's not a fact, that's an intent. It is a scrapper than uh, a reality. And so, yeah, Lee says uh, there are like, um, similar to my personal favorite objects in the whole show. Um, because I love like everything, it's not at this point. But truly, truly, I want this to be covered with and I think um, is this print right here. And um, that's not the only reason I wanted to talk about it. This also is color etching in aqua tint. But he adds some other things. He adds uh, something called soft brown. And soft ground is basically where you take your plate, you've covered it in wax, but the wax is really soft. Uh, and what that means is that you can then push uh, things into it and they will actually leave an impression. So you can do textiles. Uh, in this case, uh, I'm trying to see a really obvious moment where he did that. Um, up here, it's not really obvious because this is a pretty subtle print. But he's crumpled something up and kind of stuck it in there so that it makes this like uh, wrinkly paper. You can imagine if you crumple up paper and then um, stamp it into something. 
so we see little textures in there. It gets much more obvious than some of the other prints that he does. Um, but uh, so he's creating texture in that way with found materials. This is also uh, a print where he's using embossing. Um, and I know there's a line on the floor and you're not supposed to do this. <laughs> so I definitely did not tell you to come up here and try to get like the oblique view where you can actually see the dotted lines are raised. Um, and it's particularly obvious down here, these four little uh, nuggets are um, sort of puffed out uh, compared to the nuggets around them. Um, and so really thinking about kind of foregrounding the dimensionality of the print, thinking about it in sculptural terms. Um, and so, of course, it's not a coincidence that it is right next to the sculpture that he's creating in the same moment. Um, and he's thinking about metal as a sculptural medium, but I think what a lot of museum visitors uh, don't think about, and certainly that's because I also don't really uh, articulate it necessarily, there's only so much you can say in uh, exhibition materials, is that uh, the prince plate is also metal, right? He's also working in metal when he's working in printmaking. So the shift to sculpture, people are like, why did he even start working in sculpture? And it's like, well, because he was already working in metal. He was um, thinking about it, and he was thinking about his printmaking in these very sculptural terms. Um, so to give you a better example of that soft ground process, we're going to come over here and look at uh, the square. <clears throat> um, and here, he has used uh, soft ground extensively in that gray background. Um, so you can see there's this uh, kind of uh, lace netting that he uses. He uses burlap all over the place. Um, he uses a bridle and there's a kind of screen, like a window screen that he uses. Um, and I encourage you to like really go up there and look closely to see how that works. But it's basically a way of making this kind of indexical image of a substance in the real world. Um, another one of the cool things that happened when I was researching is that uh, in his archive, he saved all those materials. Like, he used the same piece of lace over and over and over, and I'm like, um, it's thrifty, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's like his toolbox. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. He just had it um, all set up. And, um, I like that because it's also thinking sculpturally, right? Like we don't necessarily think about this print as a sculpture, but if you if he had just collaged those objects together, we'd be like, oh, that's relief. That's obviously uh, kind of three dimensional, and so he's bringing that into the printmaking process. Um, and again, this kind of pairing where uh, the sculpture is one of the things I love about them is the shadows that they cast, and so we get that sense of kind of the two dimensional image that's created by the three dimensional sculpture has really beautiful parallels with that two-dimensionality and three-dimensionality in the prints as well. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's, that's sort of my, my spiel for this afternoon. Um, I just really wanted to take a moment to think about Mike Baker as a printmaker. There are other prints um, in the show, and I encourage you all to look at them again before uh, it closes. And, yeah, just love printmaking. Thank you.